What we're going to talk about today is securing ICS and CNI from cyber attack. So ICS, in case people don't know, is industrial control systems, and CNI is um, critical national infrastructure. Um, before we go on, my name is Adam Wedgbury, and I work in Airbus as a senior scientist, whatever that means, not so sure. Um, and I'm the technical lead for um, cybersecurity research in the UK. So a little bit about Airbus um, before we go on. Um, so everyone knows that Airbus manufactures airlines and big planes, we all fly on. Um, what people don't often appreciate is actually the, the breadth and scale of the company. So we're also one of the world's largest helicopter manufacturers. Um, we're one of Europe's largest defense subcontractors. And we're also a huge player in the, in the space industry. So heavily involved in things like the, the ESA Mars rover, um, the Rosetta lander, landed on the comet, everyone's all in, in, uh, in the news a few years ago. Um, the Ariane 5 launch alliance, all that kind of stuff. Um, and we're also a, a large player in the cybersecurity market, um, which is kind of where a lot of our research ends up. So where I sit in the organization as, as research is kind of up here, kind of above the business units in what we call the digital transformation office. And I lead the, the research team in that organization, which then feeds our research into all, all the business divisions and, and every nook and cranny of the company, if we can. So what do we do? So as you can imagine, Airbus being such a huge company, um, we have a huge um, remit within the team. Um, most of our research is internally focused, so we're focusing on protecting ourselves from attack. But because we have this cybersecurity company within Airbus Defence and Space, um, we can also push our research um, outwards um, to protect critical national infrastructure and other IT systems, so the, the MODs um, network, for instance. So I'm not going to read all that out, but you can kind of see quite a large breadth of research topics that we do. Um, and how we do that, so this is focusing more on the, the industrial control side. We have quite a complex lab and test bed network, and so this is in our lab in the UK. Um, so focusing on the industrial control systems, we have quite a, quite a range of, of demonstration systems. You can see a few on the pictures here. Um, obviously the, the things are quite small scale, so you've got some small pumps and robot arms and water treatment systems and, and even a city there in the bottom left. So all that kind of stuff is quite small scale. but. The important stuff, so the actual active controllers and, and the computerized equipment in the background is actually um, what you see in, in the real world and it's deployed as such as well. So that gives us a really rich task bed to, to both research, um, develop new tools, techniques, and also do some training on. So we do internal training and occasionally some external training. But anyway, that's enough about me and ABUS. So what we're going to talk about today is, as I said, protecting industrial control systems and critical national infrastructure. So what do I mean when I say that? So an industrial control system essentially is any computerized system that controls a physical thing in the real world. Um, so you could call it a cyber physical system. So you may see this obviously in things like um, uh, power stations maybe, um, water treatment works, um, factories obviously, so close to our heart is, is manufacturing facilities where we, we manufacture our products. Um, traffic lights, trains, um, airports, baggage handling, um, all that kind of stuff within the airport. Even at Tesco's, the conveyor belts on the, on the um, checkouts, they're all industrial control systems, essentially. So actually we're ICS and SCADA systems today, um, everywhere, absolutely everywhere, um, which gives us a real headache. So before I move on, um, I'm going to just cover some, some nomenclature quickly because I'm not entirely sure how up to speed everyone is in the audience on some of the acronym SUPA I might be using. Um, so first of all, two of the big ones we hear a lot is ICS and SCADA. So as I, I just kind of explained, ICS, Industrial Control Systems. So SCADA, you may have all heard, is Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition. So these terms are often used interchangeably, but there is, there is a subtle difference between them. So with SCADA, it's very much monitoring something with the occasional piece of control. So let's consider an oil pipeline. So you've got a long pipeline, hundreds of hundreds and hundreds of kilometers long. Um, and uh, along that pipeline, you've got some flow rate sensors, uh, some other kind of you know, valves and, and, and all that kind of stuff. So your SCADA piece will actually monitor how that kind of system is operating. It's not real-time control. It's, 
it's monitoring and the occasional control to turn things on, open things, all that kind of stuff. Whereas on the ICS side, it's more real-time control. So you've got something controlling actually how a robot arm moves through a factory and picks something up and takes it and puts it down somewhere else, for instance. So maybe the next most important one is the, the PLC or the Programmable Logic Controller. So that's often the, well often it's always the, the kind of heart of the control system. So that's, that's an embedded device which is programmed with, with a set of very simple logic commands and that basically reads in analog inputs from the sensors, um, computes it um, towards its, its logic load and then decides what the output should be, so whether a valve should be turned on or off, or whether the robot arm should move left or right, all that kind of stuff. So that's really the, the heart of a control system. You've got HMI, the human machine interface. So that's simply what the control engineer uses to monitor and control the process. So it's the, the interface between the humans <laughs> and the machines, simple enough. Um, historian, so that's basically a database. Um, so that's used a lot for um, planning and just-in-time delivery and, and real it's kind of the enterprise side, so that's where all of the process data is stored long term, and then we can use that to plan um, when we need to take deliveries of more equipment um, and maybe do preventative maintenance or predictive maintenance, so we can predict how long a component's been in use and what its workload's been, that kind of thing. Um, what else we got on here? So workstation, so that's that's often a vulnerability in these in these um, systems, so that's what a maintenance engineer will use to connect to your control network and perform maintenance and engineering tasks on, on the network. Um, that's kind of the important ones, I think I'll, I'll move on from that. So to set the scene a little bit of context, I'll go through some recent events we've had in the last decade or, or maybe two decades actually. So the first one I got is Maruchi Shire in Australia. So Maruchi Shire is obviously a place and within Maruchi Shire, um, the council built a new um, sewage works, essentially. Brand new, lovely, lovely new machinery. Um, in fact, in, within March 2000, it had just been stood up and was operational. Unfortunately, the, one of the contractors which undertook a lot of the systems integration whilst they were building the, the plant wanted a contract to continue the maintenance and the running of the plant. Unfortunately, he didn't get the contract and he got very, very angry about that. Um, so instead of doing what most rational people would do and go and have a beer and find a new job. He made sure that, that the, the wireless network essentially was insecured within the plant. And then he sat outside and started fiddling with some of the parameters on the plant. And over the course of a few months, he released, I think that says a million litres, but I think it was quite a few million litres of untreated sewage um, across Maruchi Shire um, until he got caught. And he, he did eventually get sent to jail, but the environmental impact was huge of that. Uh, moving on, um, so you probably all heard of Slammer Worm. So actually, Slammer Worm infected a nuclear power plant in Ohio, in the US, back in 2003. Um, essentially, it infiltrated the IT side um, of the plant, but it managed to disable the safety monitoring system of that nuclear power plant. No damage occurred, but obviously, that's quite a quite a big deal there. Um, it could have been much, much worse. And that came from an unsecured contractor's laptop being connected to the control <coughs> network. Moving on, um, so this is a nice one. So within Poland, um, a, a young man decided to attack the control system controlling the trams in the city. Um, so he found that the trams and the signaling was controlled by um, an infrared system. And essentially what he did was take apart a TV remote control and modify it a little bit and that allowed him to transmit signals to the, the rail controllers which caused a few trams to be derailed and a few people got injured. Um, which is mind-blowingly simple but also terrifying. And there's another story similar to this which I quite like is there was a um, one of these pumping reservoir storage power stations in the US where they pump water up to the top of the big hill and then let it down the hill in the, in the peak times to generate electricity. Um, the way this thing worked was they had a radio tower at the top and bottom and they would transmit signals between them. It's a very simple quad tone um, radio system. Um, out in the sticks in the US, a man lived between them in the middle of nowhere and he was a, a ham enthusiast so he, he loved his amateur radio. He sat there one day and he picked up this strange signal. He thought, what's this, must be aliens. So he transmitted the signal back. I'd never heard anything else and thought nothing of it. And a few days later, the same thing happened. He kept 
just transmitting the signal back. Now, in, the, in this plant, these engineers were saying, well, I've just transmitted the signal, but it's gone back to how it was. They've seen the system reverting to how it was previously, and it took them weeks to figure out that actually the command was getting through, but it was being returned by this man sat in the middle. Um, so obviously no authentication, nothing in that link. Mind blowing. So you may have all heard of the next one, Stuxnet. Um, so this was the, the big virus, very, very complicated virus, or more than a virus, I suppose, that hit a nuclear enrichment plant in the Tams in Iran um, back in 2010. So this was the, the, the big news event that kicked off a lot of research in the industrial control system. Very complicated attack. Um, I think there was three zero days, a bunch of compromised um, digital certificates. But essentially what they did was um, impact the logic on those PLCs and made the centrifuges spin at different speeds than what they were supposed to. But then they also managed to spoof the HMIs to tell the operators that those um, centrifuges were spinning at the correct speed which is why it took quite a long time for the operators of the plant to, to actually find what was going on because they were being felt, um, fed false information. Moving on from that was Havix a few years ago. Um, Havix was, it was dubbed the next Stuxnet, but nothing, it wasn't really as complex as Stuxnet and it, it didn't have quite as big a, an impact as Stuxnet. Um, but essentially it um, was quite prevalent within the energy sector in the US. Um, you may have also heard of the German steel mill um, back in the end of 2015 or early 2014, sorry. Um, so this caused a large amount of damage, caused the roof to blow off the blast furnace in a steel mill in Germany. Um, and the, the route to attack here was a remote access Trojan which got through the IT system. Not a huge amount of detail was released about this attack, but it seems like the, the impact on the control system was actually quite accidental from the attackers. Um, but that's really a, a sticking point in industrial control security is these kind of things can happen accidentally, and I'll go over why um, in a little bit. And finally, not quite the most recent, but the last one I'm going to talk about was the, the Ukrainian power plant in um, December 2015. So you may have seen this in the news, maybe not, um, but essentially um, attackers looked like state-sponsored attackers took down the power grid in eastern Ukraine. So the way they did this was quite interesting. So they, they used a spear phishing attack to, to get into the, the, the IT and the, the control for the, the power grid. Um, so your standard attack, that, which Richard just talked about, essentially email. Um, but because the control system was connected to the IT system, um, they could get a VNC, so a remote desktop connection, to a control, so a HMI essentially. And from that, they just used the button on the HMI screen to turn off the, or open the circuit breakers across that region of Ukraine. Really simple. So after doing that, they then overwrote the firmware in a lot of the, a lot of the um, controllers within the ICS estate, which made it then impossible for the, the engineers to reclose those circuit breakers um, remotely, which meant that actually engineers had to go to all the substations around eastern Ukraine and do that manually. But at the same time, they also did a denial of service attack on the call center, which meant that the 300,000 customers affected couldn't call up the power company to tell them that something was wrong. So it actually took quite a long time for the company to, uh, to determine the actual scale and, and one problem they had. Um, so from those we can see that actually attacks on ICS systems are not myths. We've not seen any huge disasters yet, but we've seen quite a few attacks um, and events which could have been much worse or which could be a prelude to something much worse. Um, so why is it so difficult um, and, and why is it different to IT? So the top one there, um, system life expectancy, is really the driver behind this. Um, so with an IT system, we put it in and we expect it to last three to five years and then we'll refresh it. So I'm sure everyone here gets new laptops every three to five years from the company. I'm sure they all have brand new network infrastructure and servers and back end every three to five years. I'm sure that happens. I'm sure there won't be any stories to the contrary. But that's, that's kind of how it goes. In the ICS world, it's actually more five to 25 years. So we, we put these things in and they stay there. So you can imagine the, the things we've got in place right now. They went in before the internet was really a thing and before people were worried about security and these things. Um, they didn't really care, they were designed for, for functionality and safety and not for security. So that's why we see so many cases with no authentication, no encryption, no authorization, and that good stuff. Antivirus, 
obviously everywhere in IT, very difficult in the ICS world. A, um, the potential to um, disable good applications, um, which is very bad in a safety critical environment. You don't want to disable a thing which does the emergency stop for your control system, for instance. And also very difficult to deploy. So we've got a lot of bespoke systems or a lot of embedded systems which just don't support the antivirus products on the market. Um, same thing with patching. So every ICS system, because it's safety critical, has a safety case. And the, the, the vendor that, that makes that system gives a safety case with it and says, if this machine is kept in this state, it will be safe. Um, so if we patch that machine, it's no longer in that state, so the safety case has to be redone, which often comes at a very big expense. Um, often it can't be done because maybe that vendor doesn't exist anymore. And also, because they're often complex embedded machines, um, it can't be done by your average IT person or the average engineer. It actually needs expert knowledge from, from the system vendor. Um, moving on a little bit, so time critical. So I know some, some IT estates are quite sensitive to delays, so the, the, the trade in market, I guess. But for the most part, we can tolerate how our emails come 30 seconds late. Um, again, in the ICS world, not so much. Often these things are, are very time sensitive, very real time, so we need that signal, signal to get where it's going within five milliseconds, for instance, sometimes, sometimes even faster. So we've got to be very careful about what load we put on the machines and on the network, not to cause delays. Um, and there's some more things there, I'm not going to go through all of them because it'll take a little bit too long. So that's what we often see as the basic security architecture for an ICS system. So you've got your nice corporate network all filed off with lots of DMZs down here and then maybe an intermediate zone and then our control system on the top. All nicely documented, all labelled up, all connected to the same network and should be easy to whack a few firewalls and a few IDS in there and, and call it a job done. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's, it's not quite like that. So a little... A little anecdote here of, of maybe um, where we are today. So we started off with one machine back in the day. Um, that machine had its own little internal network where all the components could communicate, but it's not connected to anything else. Um, then we put another machine in, same thing, another machine doing maybe the same job, different job, not connected to anything. Then one day we decided actually if we connect these guys to our corporate network, we can start to get information from these things, get some statistics and do some maintenance, all that kind of stuff. Cool. Moving on, okay, we, maybe we need to add a little bit of security, a little bit of segregation. So we, we add our, our control, kind of distributed control network over the top. But we still got that link to the enterprise network, either because we forgot about it or we think we need it. Probably we forgot about it. There you go. So we added, we added a proper link into the enterprise network now, but we still got that old link that we forgot about. It's back in the shed somewhere, probably on the modem. Then we say, okay, we've got a, I don't know, a pumping station out in the desert, so let's connect that in. We'll go through the enterprise network, because that's the only network that's got um, internet connectivity, and, and it's too expensive to run a dedicated cable, so we'll just go over the internet. And then we got another machine somewhere else. Um, we got no internet to that, but we got a phone line, so, so let's dial in. Um, it'd be too complicated to put that through the enterprise network, so let's whack a modem on, on our first machine that it's communicating to. And then we've got remote engineers, so maybe the machine we just put in needs maintenance from the vendor. The vendor lives across the other side of the world, so actually instead of getting on the plane and coming across, he dials into another modem we've just installed on our system. Oh, got another machine, um, can't quite get connectivity to, to our real machine network, so we just whack it into the enterprise network, be right. Um, another one, so we've got a new crane, got another um, distributed control network now, which we'll connect to the other one, um, make life easy for ourselves. We've got a bunch more machines. There we go. Um, great. And then we overlay the data flow on top of that. And you can see all this data flowing everywhere. No one bothered to keep any documentation of this thing when it was being created because it got done over 20 years. So no one really knows what's where. There's all these modem links and everything's connected to everything. And we're in a real mess, really. And actually, that's much more like what the real world is than that nice pretty diagram I just showed you. So hopefully that kind of sets the scene a little bit for, for actually where we are um, with all these little enclaves and stub networks and interconnections that we don't really know about. So before we get any further, I suppose, why are people targeting things, targeting these systems, and who wants to? Um, I think it's kind of obvious. So obviously we've got um, terrorism. Uh, we've not seen that we know of any terrorist attacks yet, but there's obviously a threat there. Um, you've got hacktivism, so people wanted to make a political statement, will maybe want to attack 
a country's I don't know, power distribution system, for instance. Corporate espionage. So if one of your competitors are really jealous about how good your new fangled system is, they might want to hack in and take a look at it, or, or maybe they want to cause damage and break it. Who knows? Um, script kiddies, so do it for QDOS. Um, some guys want to break something just so they can tell their mates how good they are. Or nation state, obviously. Um, so one nation attacking another nation, maybe this could be the prelude to a, a kinetic attack, so maybe we'll take down the power grid so all the lights go out and then we'll fly the bombers in afterwards. Maybe. So there's actually there's a huge range of potential threat actors against these systems. And obviously with that, those different threat actors going from script kiddies to nation state, the, the level of um, sophistication and capability and resources goes um, through the roof. Um, so vulnerabilities. So wh what vulnerabilities are present and, and how? So this all stems again from the age of these things and the attitude. So the attitude is safety and functionality. Um, not security. So things like um, the network protocols in use, almost all of them, they're not encrypted. Um, there's no authorization in that protocol. So that means that anyone on that network can actually intercept that session, they can read what's happening on that session, and they can also interject commands in that session. So actually a lot of the vulnerabilities that we find, they're not necessarily bugs, they're just the fact that these machines will do whatever you tell them to do, whoever you are. They don't care who you are, you tell them to do something, They'll do it. Um, so that's where, where a huge amount of vulnerabilities come from. But also, it's, it is bugs. So denial of service is a massive issue. So these things will fall over at the slightest tip of the hat, which is something I'll cover um, in a little bit. So they, will, they really weren't designed to operate in the, the hostile world of, of interconnected networks and the internet. They were really designed to operate in this small, well-managed network which, in which they were born. And why are they so difficult to fix? I'm going to take these transitions off, I apologize. So I kind of covered a lot of this, I suppose. Um, patching is a real problem. Um, we really can't do it very well, um, especially in cases where the vendors have, have gone out of business, or maybe they no longer support that machine. Um, so instead of giving you a patch, they'll sell you a new machine, which costs 30 million quid. Um, no one likes that. But even things like new operating systems. So we see a lot in, in control system estates, people still running on Windows NT4, believe it or not, or Windows 2000. And that's really because the vendor doesn't support an upgrade to a new operating system without buying an entirely new machine. They won't allow you to just to buy a new version of that piece of software, which will run on Windows 10. They want you to buy an entire new machine, and, and they won't support it. So cost is a is a huge problem, along with patching. Um, so up on the right there, we got a little network map. So that's a real problem. So lack of documentation. So actually, if we don't know what's on our network, how can we even begin to fix the vulnerabilities that are present? And it goes on and on and on, really. Um, even support from the the security companies. So maybe antivirus or or um, network monitoring companies, do they even support the network protocols and the systems and the operating systems in use? Um, often not. So that was a bit depressing, I suppose. <laughs> um, that's all the problems. Um, and that's where a lot of people stop. But uh, fortunately in Airbus, we got quite a vested interest in, in protecting these things. Um, so we actually come up with some solutions, or we try to. And the first is, is actually an architecture. So how do you design a security architecture to fit around an ICS system? <laughs> so the first is a mindset. And as I said earlier, safety really is critical. So these things, that they operate in real machinery, um, trains and robot arms, pumps, all sorts of stuff. Um, so actually mindset needs to be safety. Safety is king. Um, security cannot break safety. Um, and that's really key. And there's no way around it, essentially. Um, so the interesting part is actually how safety interacts with security. In my opinion, I know people have different opinions, um, but security is a subset of safety. So if you have a secure system, it's not necessarily safe because you could have safety problems that are not related to security. But if you have an insecure system, it can never be safe. Because if that system's insecure, someone can break it, so it can never be safe. So in my opinion, security is a subset of safety, and that's a real mindset that we have to have um, in this industry. So you see along the bottom there, the, the, the same old triad, confidentiality, availability, and integrity. 
So one of my real bugbears when you see or hear a lot of people talking about ICS security is they say, you've just turned the CIA triad on its head and availability is king. All we ever care about is keeping our production lines running. And that's a load of rubbish, essentially. So actually what's, what's key in these things is integrity. So we need to be absolutely sure what messages are being sent to these machines and what these machines are supposed to be doing. Um, so you imagine, imagine a chemical mixing plant. If you lose integrity in that plant and the chemicals get mixed wrong, then you could be putting out something that's not what you expected it to be. Um, or maybe you're making some volatile chemical and someone turns the furnace up too high, you could get an explosion, for instance. Or any other kind of, when you think about it, any, any other kind of industrial control system, if you lose integrity, so if someone can make modifications to that system which you don't know about, that's a real problem. So actually, integrity is king. Availability is a problem. So. Time is money, as everyone knows. If we lose availability, we're not making any money. Sometimes we, you can lose millions and millions and millions of pounds a minute, um, so it's a real problem. But also, a lot of people miss out confidentiality. Um, it's, it's a bit of a contentious one, but it's not often a problem in the ICS world, but some industries have a problem with it. So if you can imagine a pharmaceutical industry, actually, essentially, their recipe is in that control system. So how much of each component they put into that mix to make their drugs that's in there. So if they lose that, they've lost their IP essentially. Maybe also in the chemical world, the composition of the end product is, con is contained within this control system. So don't write off confidentiality. So how do we make a security architecture? First of all, King is network segregation, so that's where we start. So obviously the same thing in IT, but we kind of do it in, in two levels in the, in the ICS world. So the first is the horizontal level. So that's where we, we kind of segregate our system into different zones. Um, so it's called the Purdue model is what we go on. So the f your first zone at the top is your enterprise zone. So that's where your company lives, all your emails and your corporate and your office staff. Next zone down, number four, is your demilitarized zone. So that's not your internet demilitarized zone. That's the zone between the ICS world and the enterprise world. So it's very important in this zone that no direct connections are made between the ICS world and the enterprise zone. They go through and proxy through this DMZ. Level three is your distributed control. So that's kind of where everything lives that controls the entire process. So you're not controlling individual machines here, but you're controlling how machines communicate to each other to make the end product. And also in this zone, some people call it zone 3.5. Um, that's where you have shared services, so antivirus and Active Directory and, and all that kind of stuff. Zone two is your actual control. So that's where your PLCs and HMIs live. So that's where the engineers live and, and do their work. Zone one is the... Um, the actual controllers, no, sorry, not the controllers, the actual control system, so the, 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 the arms and the, the sensors and the actuators and the robots and all that kind of stuff. And then z zone zero is what people often forget about, so that's a safety zone. Um, so that's a dedicated bunch of equipment when actually that's isolated, actually make sure that these things don't fail in a, in a dangerous manner. So I've already mentioned uh, the DMZ there, but data diodes, so we often use data diodes to ensure the one-way push of traffic to the enterprise zone. So, he, so the, the boundary between the enterprise and the ICS world, essentially we want that connection for business planning to get statistics out, the, out of the production line so we can plan what we want to do next. So that's a one-way push of traffic, so we use data diodes for that to ensure no two-way flow of traffic. Obviously, you secure the perimeter. That's often difficult. So the little diagram I showed earlier of all the modems and interconnections, that's a real problem. You can go to, to many, many plants, um, especially large places like, um, so Richard mentioned Saudi Aramco, for instance, huge distributed things across the desert. Often they have interconnections that they don't really know about that the engineer put in one day and, and kind of forgot about. So we need to secure the perimeter. Dual home PCs. That's something we often see to connect a machine to a network. Is a, is a PC with two network cards, essentially. Often running Windows 2000 or Windows XP. Um, obviously, that's a massive vulnerability there. That PC gets compromised and that attacker has complete access to both sides of the network. Monitoring. So monitoring is difficult. Um, both, I'll come on to monitoring in a few slides, actually. And device hardening. So this is something we often forget about. So people often forget about the lessons we learned in IT when we talk about IC the ICS world. But actually turning off services on, on PLCs is very important. So they all run things, well, most of them run things like web servers, FTP servers, email servers, all that kind of stuff. And all those bits of code often have vulnerabilities. And those bits of code are often tied to the actual internal workings of the controller. And often, you see, if you take down that service with a vulnerability, you take down the entire controller. 
which is obviously quite bad. So moving on from that is asset discovery. Um, so as I mentioned, these huge bespoke networks, we don't really know what's on them a lot of the time because we didn't keep very good documentation when we built them. So we need to do device discovery, um, quite fundamental. We need, to know what, we need to know what's there before we can um, protect it. So in the IT world, it's great. So we've got a nice centralized traffic flow. So all your office machines, they don't talk to each other. They talk to the domain controller or to the internet or to the email server. So they all go through a gateway. So you can monitor that gateway and you can determine what devices are on your network. Or you can do um, active scanning. So you can port scan your yeah, ping scan or port scan, whatever you want to say, your entire network and pick up all the PCs um, on your estate. And you've got a nice big list. You can't do either of those in the ICS world, unfortunately. So first of all, we don't have that centralized traffic, that traffic model. Actually, we have a very peer-to-peer -peer system where um, hosts are talking to other hosts. No one really talks to the internet or to the file server or the domain control. That it kind of doesn't happen in, in the component world. Um, so we, it's very difficult to do passive um, device discovery because we don't have a managed network infrastructure either. Also, we can't do active scanning. Um, so a, a an example I always like is, is a research team doing a vulnerability analysis on a, on a PLC and they did a port scan to start with, a simple port scan that you do on uh, any IT system. They got to port 602, I think it was, and the device crashed, completely irrecoverably bricked. So what that turned out was that that port was reserved for firmware upgrade. And it was programmed in such a way that when it received a connection on that port, it said, okay, I'm getting new firmware. I'll dump all my current firmware and wait for the next lot. Um, Obviously, the next lot didn't come. It was just a port scan. Session timed out. Device died. Um, so you can't actively scan control networks because things like that happen. Um, so what we can up, come up with in Airbus is basically a handheld device, which does active scanning, um, but it uses protocols developed by the vendors of the ICS world to do that scan at the very low level, which is why it's handheld. So it's very low level on the network stack. So it won't traverse gateways and firewalls and that kind of thing. So actually handheld, you take it around, plug it into machines, and press a button and scan. So it's, it's a step in the right direction. It's traction on the problem. It's better than a man with a clipboard at the moment. And that's really where we are in this industry, is, is small improvements to try and get on. So I spoke about monitoring. Um, and what I said there with the, the lack of a managed network really makes it difficult to monitor because we can't get the traffic off the network to monitor it. Also, we can't do things like um, intrusion prevention systems, because if that goes wrong, if we prevent the wrong signal, that could be the emergency stop signal, for instance. So we really can't do that. We can't do host based in a lot of the places. A, for that problem. B, for resources on resource limited controllers. But also a lot of these things are embedded and no agents exist for them. Um, same kind of thing with antivirus. And a lot of the vendors don't support the, the protocols in use in the ICS world. So we really need some bespoke techniques, both for the actual systems, but also the deployment of the systems. Um, but this is one place where ICS does give us a leg up in that it's a very deterministic network. So th same things happen all the time, signal, signal, signal. It's very predictive or pre predictable what's going on in that network. So actually we can see very easily when something and what happens in, in the network traffic. So that's the, basically the only place where, where ICS gives us a leg up. Uh, moving on, the, the kind of final piece of the puzzle um, is forensics. So, okay, we've, we've done our architecture, we've done our monitoring, and we've done some risk, risk before, and I didn't cover risk. But also now, um, post-event, we need to find out it, if an event occurs, we need to find out how it happened and, and maybe who did it. So this is where we're looking at forensics. Forensics, we've got four problems. Well, we've got many problems, but four, four kind of main pillars. The first is scale. So you go into a, a manufacturing plant, maybe, um, and it's a huge thing, massive. Um, with maybe 10,000 hosts in it. So as a forensics team, how do you even go about starting your forensics acquisition in that place? Massive problem of scale. Next is technology. So, okay, we've identified where our problem is. We need to extract the forensic artifacts um, from, from that system. How do we do that? How do we, how do we get the data off the things? Um, and the third one is then what does an attack look like on these systems? So, okay, we've found what the affected system is, we've pulled off all the forensic artifacts, but actually, what does an attack look like? We don't really know at the moment. So how do the analysts work? And then finally, the fourth one is a procedural problem. So, as I said earlier, availability is often a real thing, so time is money and all that. So the often, the often response to 
a component going down is to rip it out and replace it with a new one. So we don't really know if it's cyber attack yet or not. It's just a failure. So we rip it out, replace it with a new one. So obviously we've lost power now to this device. Um, we've lost all that volatile data. Um, all those forensic artifacts are gone. Um, so how can we deal with that? How can we make new policies or maybe make new tools which makes which negates this problem? Um, so that's where we are in the forensics world, and we're we're slowly getting traction on that. Um, we've got a few tools and techniques in the pipeline, um, but it's onwards. And I'm running out of time, so I got just a few things left to say. Um, to further the effort, we do a lot of work with academia. Unfortunately, Plymouth University isn't on this slide yet. I'm sure it will be someday. Um, we are working on it. But we do a lot of PhDs and a lot of directly funded projects with universities around the UK and also overseas, um, especially in the US and in Singapore. We publish a lot as a team, um, so we are a very external facing team for our research. We do a lot of publications in the, in the outside world. Um, it's just a, I'm not expecting you to read that, it's just an example. And we also do a lot of public events. Um, so you guys may have heard of the Cybersecurity Challenge. Um, so we did, a, we did the masterclass on HMS Belfast in 2015. We've got 42 amateur, amateur enthusiasts, I like to call them, to come and attack some of our control system test bed. Um, and, and basically exercise our security architecture and I'm pleased to say none of them actually broke it which is why I'm still in my job which is which is good and we're also doing this this year as well um, in a few months time and that's it almost on time thank you very much